Boom. Good evening, everybody, or where, depending on where you are, good morning. Um, today, I have the pleasure of being on with my good friend, Elizabeth Leva. Uh, Liz, I'm not going to lie to you. I mess up everybody's name right up front. So I feel like we've known each other long enough that I should have it correct. But tell me, is that correct? It's not. What? Oh, it, everyone says Liba because it, it like phonetically speaking, it looks like it should be, but it's actually Liba. And that's actually God. wrong because we we anglicized my name. My that's my dad's right? last name. So that it should be Leva because it's actually Spanish. It's a Cuban name. So when I used to work in Miami, people would be like, Oh, Leva. And then they just start rattling off stuff in Spanish. And I'm like, oh no, no, no. The name <laughs> Cuban, I don't speak Spanish. And they would like, be don't like, Don't let the name fool you. Yeah, I, but the, the, the disappointment on their faces, I almost wanted to start <laughs> pretend, like, I'm like, what can I do? Do I have like some kind of, you know, I, I was so sad because it was just like that culture in Miami is so vibrant. We would get Cuban coffee shots and everybody's in the office just speaking Spanish and everything else. And they just start engaging in conversation, you know, when you go to the local deli or whatever because if you write your name down people just assume right. and give them the credit card oh okay Everybody knows. Bah, 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 bah. and it's like no sorry and it's just like you don't speak <laughs> like, <laughs> no so yeah it's yeah. actually liba that's the anglicized version but a lot of people say liba jeez well good to know now after like two or three now years you know you yet. got now you got the whole background all right so everybody story. i want to introduce liz liba uh my good friend <laughs> No, actually, you know what? Let me do this. Before we jump in, Liz, let me let me count us down and we're going to get everybody ready to hear all about your amazing story, your life and all that good stuff. So give me 30 seconds. We're back. Just, I'm not gonna lie to you. I didn't even need that. I just wanted to use it because it's a button I can click. So I was jamming. I was like, dit, 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 right. I was just up in the. Yeah, I so, don't. I don't like to not have that countdown just because it gives me that that little boost of energy. The, hey, hey, Lisa. That, look, there Yay, is something about it. That my is girl. Hey, let me just just say really quickly. Uh, obviously, I love Lisa. I like. She's one of the people who, as she writes, too. yeah, like I'm just like consuming it. Uh, I'm a very, very content consuming person. And Good. when I, when there are people who write really well, like I, That's I'm on board. Yeah. And, and Lisa did your, um, she did the, um, geez, why am I blanking? Uh, the, the forward? introduction, the forward, yes. yes. The introduction the to forward. the forward to your book, right? Yes, she did. She's an amazing writer. It's very, I think for me, when I'm thinking about writers that I admire, I always think about writers yeah. that emit energy. I'm really big on energy. So I love to think about like people that for me, because I studied writing, I went to school for journalism. I mm -hmm. taught creative writing for over a decade. I think about writing as like an art. It's, it's somewhat of a science, but a lot of it, you have to have passion for the written word. And mm -hmm. the, the, the way that I look at, amazing writers like a Toni Morrison or Maya mm -hmm. Angelou, Alice Walker, the the writers that I grew up lis uh, writing, listening to, the writers that I grew up reading, Zora Neale Hurston, their words jump off the page, yeah. grab yep. you and make you feel yep. emotion. And that's what yep. Lisa's writing does for me. Yep. It's something that evokes an emotion. There's a spirit there that is more than just the word. The word really becomes a thing it's like a living breathing thing yep. that you can actually touch and feel yep. the, so that's the hallmark about, of a good writer yeah yeah I, look there's something about the written word uh so before we jump into your written word what i'd like to do let me let, so i won't try to introduce you i know how i know you but okay. tell us a little bit about who liz liba liba who you are <laughs> liz liba liba liz uh, 
Yeah. Who am I? I mean, that's, yes. that's literally the first line of the book is who are you? And I think for me, a lot of my background is in the fact that I've always felt like I was outside looking in at the world, being mm. someone that is an immigrant. I was born in the UK, in London and raised here in South Florida. I always looked at the world just like always exploring it to try to figure out what was happening, what's going on, how do people react, how do people think. So a lot of my formative years were just trying to figure out like my space in the world, especially living in mm -hmm. South Florida because it grew up in East Fort Lauderdale, predominantly black area. It's actually the segregated where I grew up. It's the segregated side of Fort Lauderdale. Mm. So that was where all the black folk had yep. to live because yep. of segregation in South Florida, the high school that I went to was the black school, mm -hmm. which means that it was, um, it's called Dillard High School, but it was like P19 or whatever. Yeah, so that yeah. was the school that only the black kids <laughs> until, uh, you know, desegregation, that was where all the black children in Fort Lauderdale went to school. Mm -hmm. So for me growing up, it was kind of like, okay, I'm from UK, I'm mm -hmm. brown, black, right? And, mm -hmm. and my skin is the same as everyone else, but my culture is totally different. My parents Jamaican. The name, like I said, my dad's family is um, originally they're Jewish, so they're actually Sephardic Jews that fled the Holocaust. All the hmm. all of the, uh, the the annihilation, the genocide, mm -hmm. everything was happening in Europe where Jews were being persecuted. They fled and they actually ended up all over, scattered all over, and ended up in Cuba. Hmm. My dad's my my dad's grandfather left Cuba when Castro came to power and uh, he went there with his brothers and raised his family and the, all the generations from then on lived in Jamaica. So that's my dad's side of the family. That's why I never will change. I've never changed my last name. I never will because I'm really proud of my heritage. Sure. And it, it talks, I mean, I'm thinking about like everything that they went through. You're thinking about fleeing persecution. You're yeah. thinking about everything that, you know, black folk, brown folk have had to endure those of different religion, like Jew, Jewish, have had to endure persecution. And that is something that I'm really proud of. And yeah. with my upbringing in Fort Lauderdale, I wanted to have a, a, an amount of pride in my blackness that was my adopted country, which was America. Um, it's so crazy because when, when, Anyone who knows you, anyone who reads your your stuff, anyone who sees you, and I've had the pleasure of talking to you for a couple of years now. You are you you stand up for so much stuff, and <clears throat> I think I told you when we talked about a month ago. Like I am amazed because technically you could you could stay on the outside, right? You could say, "Hey, well, I'm from the UK." You know, my family isn't American. We're we're Jamaican. You can you can you can point back to your lineage. You can look at it any of these ways, but then there's a part of you that seems to say, "I need to step up." Like I can I can act like some people who say I don't have a dog in this fight, but you choose to jump in it. Why? why? <laughs> That's a good question. I tell people that all the time. I don't have a dog in a fight. Because I, I, sometimes people are like, oh, you just want reparations. You're just, you're a shyster. You're just trying to get people reparations. I'm like, dude, I won't even get any reparations. Like, I would not because obviously any brown person, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of people don't seem to realize this, any brown person in the Western Hemisphere is a descendant of slavery. Yep. That's yep. without a doubt. Yep, that's just real. Because yep. black and brown people were kidnapped from Africa and brought to the Western Hemisphere. Most of them actually went to Brazil. Mm -hmm. Not even as many actually came to America. So anywhere throughout this Western side of the globe mm -hmm. where descendants of Africans probably mixed with indigenous Indian, mm -hmm. um, Native mm -hmm. American, or all the hodgepodge mm -hmm. of different types of people that yep. the colonizers found and then they mix with people. So we're all, that's why we're all different shades. And sometimes it, it it boggles my mind that people don't really even understand the history of America, let alone the history of the world. So when I think about not having a dog in a fight, I just think about the fact that as a human being, if I'm seeing something that's not fair, maybe it's also because of the fact that when I was younger, and it kills me when people are like, well, I've been teased. And it's like, well, I've been teased too, because I'm not from here. And people mm -hmm. picked on me too. I've been attacked. I've been chased home and I've, from people that look just like me. 
but yeah. that doesn't mean that I'm not going to stand up for people that have been wronged. And it, and I just think it's just, a, it's, for me, it's just being empathetic. I know what it feels yeah. like to be picked on. I know what it feels like to not feel like you belong. I know what it feels like to be an outsider. So if I have the ability to use my voice, when I used to get picked on in school and I felt like an outsider, what I started to do was become the class, class clown. A lot of people mm -hmm. that know me, all I do is tell jokes. I'm always being silly. I'm actually not as serious as probably people think that I am. But a lot of that was my defense mechanism because I was like Eminem. I'm like, I'm going to start picking on everybody else before people pick on me. <laughs> so I became that loud person. I'll never forget. My mom had to come down to the school and the teacher was like, it was like my English teacher in middle school. All my teachers were black, so they did not play that. They would call mm -hmm. your mom in a minute yep. and be like, she's cutting up in this class. She's not listening. She's getting her grades. She's getting her homework, but she talked too much. And I just remember the teacher being like, yeah, Liz is doing really well, but she's just, just talking way too much. And my mom was just like, bad like when we get home it's on a problem <laughs> that was just my mo throughout middle school and high school because i was just that person that even if i was not necessarily getting picked on because i became this loud mouth so people were scared to pick on me mm -hmm. if someone else was getting picked on i would jump in and be like uh no if you're gonna pick on them you got to pick on me too because mm. it's just this idea that if we see someone that can't stick up for themselves or well, they need help, if, if it's not, obviously, I mean, you're in middle school, so you're not going to put your life in danger in that mm -hmm. scenario. But if I have the ability to stand up for someone and use my voice to help them mm -hmm. or give them some kind of encouragement, maybe that's why I went into education too, because I always feel like if I can help someone to encourage them or give them just a little bit of motivation, the same way that people did for me, because yeah. I wouldn't be where I am now if someone hadn't believed in me, stuck up for me, encouraged me. So I, it's like my responsibility, I think, to do that, even if I don't have a dog in the fight, because my teachers didn't have a dog in the fight and yeah. they still encouraged me and did everything. Uh, I think sometimes people think when you grow up in a black neighborhood, you don't have strong role models. And I posted all week about the sorority and fraternity yeah. members that we saw growing up in the community, people that have barbershops, people that were business owners, people that <clears> owned <throat> um, Mizell Library, which is like a huge, uh, you know, they have funeral home. And that was where the, the, the center of the black community was on mm -hmm. the east side of Fort Lauderdale. And I would go to the library and you would have people that were just there to coach and mentor and encourage. And they had community programs. So, that being a recipient of that, I feel like I have to pay that forward in some way. If there's something I can do to help my community, I came from another country and my community, right. that black community in Fort Lauderdale is what helped me to get the University of Florida. I went there on a full scholarship. I was home. The recruiter came. I was home because I had the flu. My guidance counselor called me on the phone and said, get on the phone with the recruiter. They want to talk to you. They're probably going to offer you a scholarship. She didn't have to do all that. So mm -hmm. uh, it's it's incumbent on me now to pay that kindness forward in any way that's, that I can. I got to tell you, that's that, that, I mean, it, it's awesome to hear, but it feels like so much of a rarity. We have such a polarized world, you know, it's like, everybody is like, Hey, this is my team. It's so much tribalism, so much us, them. And to kind of see you, um, you have this sort of mixed heritage. I know the last time we spoke, it was me and you and future. And you were all were talking about having mixed children and this, this and that, and how there's still like this, this sense of togetherness that you fight for. Let, let's unpack it a little bit. I know you talked a little bit about, you know, hey, I'm if I'm getting picked on, if I'm if I'm seeing injustice, you know, I want to stand up for it. But what do you think that is? Why is it that you're doing it and so many other people are saying, well, let me just stick with my group and let me, you know, do the thing that fits for me? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think a lot of it is fear. A lot of it is conditioning. I think people are conditioned, especially, I think the weird thing about America is a lot of people don't travel outside of this country. So don't really mm -hmm. realize what it's like in Europe or what it's like in the Caribbean or what it's like in Latin America. And I think there is a, a trope that we've seen a lot, especially over the past few years, with different president and different, you know, philosophies and, and mantras that are kind of being touted. And this idea of American exceptionalism, manifest destiny, you know, mm -hmm. working hard, pull yourself up by, by your bootstraps and is, you know, very independent. It's yeah. really not 
necessarily culturally something that black folk have done. It's not something Caribbean folk have done. It's not something that you see in the Latin community or even some of the other communities like the Asian community. There is a sense of like, we stick together and we need to grow and win together. And I think unfortunately with American culture, some people love the idea of individualism. I'm going to step out here and conquer, but that doesn't necessarily work for people that are not, that were not meant to be in this structure Mm -hmm. of what America was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. If you were a white male landowner, not even just a white male, white male and of means with wealth and property, then you were in that box to be, Oh, I'm going to get out here and conquer and be independent. Everybody else really didn't, have the ability to do that. So I think that that has become the mantra for America. And what we're seeing is working class people are suffering. If you're not in that 1% or you're not someone that's wealthy or business owner, you're the person that's getting all the benefit. They keep those people in power in government and everyone else kind of looks up to those people and wants Mm -hmm. to aspire to be them, but will never be them. We know that we won't because our skin color and our culture Mm -hmm. precludes that. But even people that fight us and say, well, you know, work harder. It's like, but you're working harder, supposedly. (laughs) You're not getting anywhere either. Well, aren't you part of the 1%? Yeah, Yeah, why is the 1% growing? (laughs) Exactly. They're going to stay getting rich because they're putting... And this is what, I mean, we think about the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. This is what he was saying toward the end of his life. That we really should be banding together, all of us in the working class, and trying to hold those people in power, that top 1% government officials, people that frame the way that this country works, hold them accountable. But what tends to happen is the tribalism that you talked about. Yeah. Everyone wants to have a little bit of a step up above somebody else. And a lot of as it's yeah. human nature and psychology where people feel a little bit like, oh, I'm superior to you. And that's how they were able to get during the civil war. And I'm all over the place because I'm thinking about all the things that happened in this hundreds of years worth of stuff that you think about during the civil war, a lot of the people that fought the, to uphold slavery didn't even own slaves. Yep. So you have this yep. idea that people have been manipulated and tricked mm-hmm. and brainwashed into thinking that, hey, I'm going to fight for this 1% because they have that mm-hmm. my best interest mm-hmm. in mind. And that's happened ever since the beginning of time. And we're basically in that hierarchy. We're always typically at the bottom, at the bottom. or very near the yep. bottom. And it's like, hey, if I'm above you, then at least... I'm not on the bottom. There you go. So you have people <laughs> that will, will oppress you and step on your neck mm-hmm. just so that they are not. It's on like, the look, I'm still in the bottom 50%, but I'm not in the bottom 25. Exactly. So. <laughs> and that's why they don't do it. Why would they, you know, if you think about how human nature is, there is a it's a poverty mindset or lack of you know resources, supposedly, but keeping in mind that everybody i mean there's eight billion people there's so much there are resources i mean a lot of the resources are lacking because we are we're over consuming them but there's enough to go around for everybody if people weren't pillaging and taking if you think about africa as a country i always feel like when people like oh africa is a developing nation or you know even the caribbean is developing latin america is developing well then why did you guys pillage it why Mm. how they're developing Mm -hmm. now trying to redevelop because all of their wealth yeah. has been stolen, has been pillaged, has been, you know, the, the, the Queen of England wasn't just walking around with this huge diamond the size okay. of, you know, a melon, mm. because where did that come from? So when we're thinking about, you know, this poverty mindset, a lot of times what's happening is it's almost like I was thinking about it. It's almost like the Matrix. It's almost like the story mm. has been totally flipped around where you have a small minority of people that are saying, this is what needs to get done in mm-hmm. order for us all to be successful. But they're not say when they I mean, say all, they mean their group. Right, which right. Is, all of all the de- small, tiny one percent. Yeah, that small <laughs> group. And then anything that they do is going to be in their own interest while convincing you, I'm ne- you're next. I'm going to work for you next. And I think a lot of times with black folk, we get that same answer. Like, mm-hmm. okay, your time is coming. And, and when we think about enslaved Africans, that was done too. It's like, you know, your, your heaven is going to be after this life. Yeah. So you're trained to almost think, well, next day, tomorrow, mm-hmm. next week, next year. Uh, I just posted about James Baldwin. How much, how much longer do you need? Right. Mm-hmm. It's this sense that people have been trained to typically just, really look out for their own best interests. And mm-hmm. by doing that, everyone is going to suffer because we're none of us are getting anywhere. Let, let me ask you this, Liz. The the 
I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot and, and make you kind of ruler of the world for a second here. Uh, if I rule the world. There hey. you go. There you go. Hey. Look, I, don't y'all, I was about to say, y'all don't know, but right before the show, I was telling Liz, like, she showed up today because she brought that Wu-Tang out. Like, everybody. Wu-Tang's for the kids. Like, Wu-Tang's for the babies. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's right. Wu-Tang. <laughs> Oh man, let me just tell you right now, if you don't know what we're talking about, you're probably on the wrong show. Probably too young to be Uh, our friend. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Okay, so let me put you in charge of everything. What what does it look like? So let me just preface this by saying, I know that there's a lot of people, the Jay-Zs of the world, all all of the the new rich black billionaires, they're saying, hey, what we need is generational wealth, that sort of thing to equalize power, blah, blah, blah. Let me ask you. What needs to happen? I mean, you can let me know if you agree with that, but what needs to happen and to make the world whatever it should be? And what would that look like? So you 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 got it all. You 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 can put it all into place. What does it look like? I mean, the world, in order for it to really be equitable and for everybody to have access, it would have to be this society where like the idea of Ubuntu, where it's like mm-hmm. we are a global. Mm -hmm. Just community where everyone cares for each other. I always think about what happened in like Tulsa, Oklahoma, Mm -hmm. or these thriving black communities that we all Mm -hmm. have heard of. Rosewood is one that was actually 20 minutes away from where I went to school, Mm -hmm. University of Florida. Mm -hmm. And communities gathered their resources together and everyone helped each other. So, and that's, you know, a part of when I think about just, our actual heritage, our African roots and culture, a a, a part of what makes Africa such an amazing, just our, all of our motherland, not just Mm -hmm. black folk, but everybody was this sense that women were revered as gods. The, we know that Africa is the motherland and there wasn't a lack of resources. When you think Mm -hmm. about Mansa Musa, the fact that when he went, and had the pilgrimage to Mecca, he mm-hmm. threw gold out to all the people. <laughs> they mm-hmm. had so much gold, richest man ever, richer than Bill Gates, richer than Jeff Bezos. And he threw so much gold to the people that he basically devalued gold, but he didn't even care because he had so much gold. So I think we almost would have to go to this idea that everyone has to be taken care of. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's something that is so counter to what capitalism is all about. It's so counter to the American way of, hey, I got mine, you got to get yours, pull yourself up Mm -hmm. by your bootstraps and all these these, uh, sayings and and all these (laughs) ideas that really are not realistic. We would Mm -hmm. have to go to a a sense of community where everyone knows that I can't win without everybody else in my community winning. And you do see that, I think, in countries where it's very, it's a part of the cultural landscape where you take care of people that can't take care of themselves. And you see that in some countries, like in Europe, they have their problems with race and all these other issues as well. But one thing I will say is there is a sense that you won't, you know, there isn't this idea that, hey, I don't care if if I got mine, you just got to figure it out on your own. When you see countries where they're like, well, we want to just have housing for everyone. Or you see countries where they're like, we can't let people not have health care. And then you see America where it's like, I got my I got my benefits or I got what I need. There, there needs to be more of, I think, this idea of a collectivism mm-hmm. around the idea that we need to take care of each other. It's just something that I think if I waved my wand, that's what I would want to see. It's just, I think it's just so counter to the way that we've been programmed in the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in the West, because there is a sense that everyone is out to be this next millionaire, billionaire, accumulate wealth and and not really thinking about, well, if we distribute it to everyone, then everyone would be better off. But people don't think like that. I, I, let, let me just say this. This makes me think back to, uh, geez, what was the cartoon? Uh, uh, man, the, I can't remember now. Incredibles. Oh, the Incredibles. Incredibles. <laughs> when the, when the, the guy says, hey, if everybody's special, then nobody is. 
And that makes me really think about, I wonder if that's kind of where we are. And that's why I bring up the thing about, you know, um, there are a lot of black folks now who are saying, hey, what we need is that generational wealth. And then we're on the equal footing and we can be competitive. But so in your mind, is that enough if everybody has or is there still that lack or is there still that need for the, um, you know, the one world toward a concept, the, you know, like where if 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 everybody has and 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 races are, you know, money is equally distributed and that sort of thing. Where's the problem at the end? Because I got to figure it's more than just an economic issue. Well, it's it's not just economics. I think when people start to say, oh, it's just a class thing. It really yeah. isn't just a class thing. We know that there are, if you think about people like Serena Williams, where she's like, I'm a millionaire and I went to have my baby. And yeah. she almost died when she went to have her baby. So we know that money isn't necessarily going to solve it. We saw yeah. Ryan Coogler yeah. get arrested when he went in the bank to cash the check. It really would mm. have to be like a, ra a radical restructuring of the okay. way that we even see each other. I always think about social constructs and the idea that a lot of the social constructs and things that we agree with or abide by or fight for are really just somebody came up with this idea yeah. and everyone was like, yeah. yeah, let's run with that, right? Yeah, because like it, now it, this is important. That, right, and that's yeah. usually, I just saw a TED talk and oh my gosh, it's going to probably bother me because I can't think of the name of the woman but she talked about this idea that the the currencies that we have in the west are based on gold mm -hmm. but the gold comes from Africa but the African money is not worth as much as the money there in the go. west so <laughs> it's this whole idea of your pillaging resources and then you look back and you're like you're pillaged now so you're a third mm -hmm. world or you're developing and it's just like that we would have to look at how we look at other yeah races quote Man, unquote I get, I get that, the that's that a structure in and of itself because that's it, it really is a figment of our imagination someone came up with that it's like you know what we should do yeah. let's mm -hmm. say that you're different you're different yeah. right evolution yeah. obviously has, not as good yeah right evolution has made you have curly hair because you yeah. lived in the warmth and i have long straight hair because i was in the cold so now my features or the way that I look is superior and yeah. that's this is the hierarchy that we're going to come up with and the sad thing is we fall into that because you got yeah, people of color yeah, being yeah. like well I'm light skinned or I'm Asian I'm Latin I'm this I'm that and the anti this and the anti that when it's just like we're all from Africa and we're but all, we're that all is human, beings, human yeah. beings that migrated and we all just have different there's just, literally no biological basis for the idea of race because race is hereditary it is, so it's yep. really features that are yep. I, I yep. when we had the talk with future i talked about my son and he looks white i mean it's it's he would be i would take him to the store with me or out and about maybe to a doctor's appointment and people would say yeah. That's your son. Like, <laughs> that's your child. You the, they thought you were the nanny. They thought I was the nanny, right? So that shows you just how arbitrary it is. Race yeah. is in the eye of the beholder. It really Nobody is. Nobody would it's know so, about my background unless I told them. That's right. So there's this idea that we've all bought into some arbitrary structure of what society yeah. should be. Capitalism, manifest destiny, everybody for himself. race should be okay. Black folk are this, Asian people are that, Latin people are this. Um, you know, we saw what happened with September 11th. All of a sudden, now people from the Middle East are this. You but you right. people just make stuff up, it, and then that it, becomes reality, unfortunately. I, I just saw this post earlier about uh how Finland is like the number one country in the world as far as like detecting misinformation. And it made me think so much about how there's such a huge need for that around the world because there are so many places and so many people where uh, we get we feed into this. And now, uh, you know, in, in, in black culture, there's, you know, long hair versus the curlier hair, lighter skin versus darker skin and all of this kind of stuff where for years it's just like these have been generational issues that are coming from. Uh, like unless somehow someone with darker or lighter skin is somehow living longer or, you know, like their economic status is better. I, I don't know. But outside of that, it really is just arbitrary um, to me that that. Well, actually, you know what? Before I go into a rant, let me do this. I want to oh, I I a good rant now. 
Well, you know, it's just that I have so many things I want to make sure I bring up to you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do a, uh, I, I was looking at Tracy Ellis Ross. Is that her name? Tracy Ellis Ross? Mm -hmm. uh, Diana Ross's daughter. Diana I was Ross looking at, yeah. she has the, um, uh, like an eight part series, 10 part series about black hair. And I am fascinated, just fascinated with the perspectives and the inside look on um exactly what black women go through and how they're looking at it and how it's viewed and that sort of thing. I have I have a black wife, I have black sister, black mama, and to kind of get an understanding of like where they're at and what they're going through behind the scenes is fascinating to me. I want to do something along those lines to uh to really kind of bring out uh information about that. So first off, let me put you on the spot. Will you be on it with me? Can we have a discussion live <laughs> about black hair? I you, all, you did this right whole there. build up. Hi, I was Jack. like, Hi, Jack. <laughs> I will do anything you want me to do, any discussion, anytime, Good. any place, I'm there. So, yeah, Good. Uh, you got it. <laughs> okay, so now that we got a, a verbal commitment, now that we uh, got that let, out of the way, <laughs> let me ask you what in, in your eyes, because I, I want to shift to your book a little bit, which focuses on black women in the workplace, but obviously in life what what when we're talking about stuff like um colorism and and the difference in shades and all those kind of things what needs to happen in your opinion because again you got your magic wand in the black community with black women what needs to happen uh to to settle that solve that relieve us of that pressure with black men and women I think a lot of what has happened with black men and women in our relationship, that's a generational trauma too. You mm -hmm. know, when you think about what's been passed down net from generation to generation to generation, it was in the best and people always like, Oh my God, stop bringing that up. It's so long ago, but it really wasn't that long ago. If you think about the, mm -hmm. uh, what's happened mm -hmm. in the past 20 years, we wouldn't recognize America 20 yep. years ago. Like yep. we, the internet basically has changed even the way yep. that we process the world. So when we think about a hundred years ago, or 150 years ago, that is not that long in the time span of a country. America is a really young country too. Really so that's yep. a, that's another thing that I think distorts people's perception of time. Mm -hmm. And for us, I think coming to this country when Americans, African, enslaved Africans were brought to the soil, it was in the best interest of those that wanted to subjugate them to make them believe that, hey, you have to fight against each other because, yeah. you know, they would kind of hold that up as though, and we talked about that throughout the time that you have this stratus of, okay, I'm going to make a yeah. hierarchy. So if you take everyone's, these people, and you take their religion, you take their language, you take their name, you take everything mm -hmm. about their identity and make them believe you're subhuman. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, what do you hang on to? Now the, you you have to fight to try to leverage yourself because you're literally not allowed to read. You don't have access to anything other than a Bible. And if anyone has a Bible, it can only be talked about in the presence of the yeah. white person that is in charge of your life, literally. So I think when we think about generational trauma, that trauma runs really deep. And black men were emasculated. Black yeah. men were not even allowed to be with their family. Black women were at the whim and were owned by whoever. So that could be yeah. the owner of the plantation. It could be their sons. It could be a visitor that came to town. You had no rights whatsoever to your own body. Your husband had no right to you. You had no right to your own children. And we're not talk talking about something that happened millions of years ago in dinosaur yeah. days. Yeah. American slavery only ended officially in 1865. So you have this yeah. whole dynamic that even in reconstruction and after slavery was abolished, there is still this black family that is in disarray. Because yeah. if you as a man cannot provide for your family, how can you? You where are you gonna work? Because oh. after slavery ended it wasn't like well come into microsoft yeah. amazon's hiring <laughs> where were they gonna go yeah. they had to go right back to the plantation to yeah. be sharecroppers yep. because and get there wasn't basically any options. slaves yep basically yeah. I i'll say this um along those lines i grew up in the projects and i, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie claudine um no. but yeah it's one of those 70s black films um in the projects if you couldn't have a man in a house Right, this is the 80s. Stamps. 
Yeah. yeah like yeah, if yeah. you had a man in the house and we had it where the public housing authority would come in our house, they would come in, they look, they would check. Yeah. They'll come <laughs> in and they'll check if you had an extra me, iron know. or a toaster and all of that. It's like, who's providing this for you? So yeah. even up until, you know, that's what 40 years ago, there's less than 40 years ago, there's yes. still uh, a systematic disruption in the black family. So I, that is that is so close to right now that it's almost surprising in my mind that uh, we don't have um, specific like psychology just for black folks because it feels like we need it. Yeah. And it's, there is a dearth of uh, therapists that are black. I know when yeah. I was trying to get therapy, it's very yeah. challenging because it's uh, we're underrepresented in pretty much every field right. anyway. But right. therapy is uh, psychology and psychiatry and counseling is definitely one of the areas where black folk, if you think about PTSD, and I saw something, yes. a post yesterday yes. about it's almost like not even a disorder, it's, it's a reaction because you're yep. under extreme stress. Black folk are the highest, have the highest levels of stress, uh, autoimmune disease, yep. high blood pressure, all these different things because we're constantly in the state of fight or flight. We're constantly worried. And I think it's yeah. sad because we have people that are telling us, what's wrong with you? Like, just get it together. Everything's fine. It's like, but we're not. We live in a constant state of hypervigilance and yeah. Yeah. we're being told that what we're saying or we're how we're feeling. It. Yeah. Being gaslighted, like, yeah. what are you talking about? And I think that was a part of what has started to trigger me <laughs> myself because I think about the idea that for a lot of us, we actually are under a huge amount of stress and yeah, COVID yeah. and the pandemic actually made it worse because we were more likely to be unemployed. I spent probably about a year being in fear for my job because we went through a buyout. Yep. So if you're constantly under that kind of pressure and you know, if you go get your let go from your job and you're going out there in the job market, you're already now predisposed to not being able to find a job right. because you're you're not the right shade right. then think about all that that goes into that the fact that black folk in america are at the bottom or near the bottom in almost every single indicator for well-being and people are telling us well give us some more time we're going to figure it out mm -hmm. no <laughs> Yeah, like, like we're, 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 we don't need any more studies we already like the stats are right there and it reminds me of a very when i think about relationships and mental health Mm -hmm. I think about like um, trauma and I think about abuse. If yeah. you're in an abusive relationship, a lot of times if you go to the person, like, please stop hurting me. You know, I don't, you know, can we come together and figure out, let's work through this. The person will tell you, what are you like? No, like, yeah, I, I'm, I didn't not do anything. You. I'm not hurting you. Like you, you brought this on yourself or they'll tell you that didn't happen or mm -hmm. you can have evidence. And they're just like, no, like I didn't do any of that. And in this gaslighting, if you think about living under that circumstance, yep. not for a constantly. year, not for two years, yep. constantly from the time you're born in America mm -hmm. until the time you die, you're at a disadvantage. Yeah. Black folk have the lowest infant mortality rates, the, the highest infant mm -hmm. mortality rates, as well as mm -hmm. maternal mortality rates. So mm -hmm. as a black woman pregnant, you go into the hospital already in a state of hypervigilance because you yep. already know all your family's told you. You didn't even have to look at the statistics because everybody in your family has a horror birth story. That's so right. we go into the hospital, <laughs> not even like, oh, hey, girl, man. I was asking for payments and they thought I was a drug addict. Like, we all have yeah. those stories. And if, if we're all saying the same stories and then people are like, no, that's not true. We have anecdotes and we have statistics. It is true. And mm -hmm. then they'll tell you, well, you're being divisive because you're saying doctors are prejudiced now. So now you are becoming, instead of being the victim, you're yeah. the problem yeah. because you're pointing yeah. out that you want, like Jeez. Serena Williams, I just want care. I just don't want to be afraid when I go to the mm -hmm. doctor. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us have been through situations where we've been misdiagnosed. People don't tell us, you know, what we need. And we're looking at other communities and no one else is saying this. So clearly it's not just us. But if you have that in your mind playing the whole time, that mm -hmm. every time I tell someone something is going on, whether it's in the K through 12 school system, yep. whether it's in yep. healthcare, whether it's in wages, whether it's in hiring, whether it's criminal justice system, anything that you could think mm -hmm. of, any institution that we interact with, Yep. We are at a disadvantage. That's not me speculating. That's not me thinking that might be true. That is a fact. Home ownership, wealth, anything. There's not. There isn't anything. Maybe um, members of the NBA. Like there's yeah. nothing where we are <laughs> rap, good rappers. I don't know. There's nothing that we are at the top. And when we think yeah. about that, that's only yeah. because those were the things that, if you think about going back to slavery again. 
we were encouraged to, hey, let's get them to play some music. Let's do some dancing. When you think about cakewalk and all these things where people say, oh, that was a cakewalk. That was a real thing. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of you were a trained performing, you were to work mm -hmm. and you were there for pleasure. And that's and that where pleasure, your value came could, from. Your value was that. So it could be singing. Yeah. It could be dancing. It could be sex. It could be whatever. You were at their whim. Yeah. So if you think about the things that we did to even, I always think about how black folk are the hugest consumers of goods and we use a lot of TV and a lot of internet. Why is that? We actually yeah. not high in drug use. And that's another misconception. Black people use a lot of drugs. That's not true. Hmm. But what is true is we consume a lot. We buy a lot. Mm -hmm. We are very prone to mental health issues. We are very prone to diving into the internet. Why is it every internet platform, probably LinkedIn might be the only one. That's because we got people always trying to run us off and tell yeah. us to go on Facebook. Yeah. But <laughs> Facebook, right. you think about internet usage, we use like social media. We were like duck to water when it came mm -hmm. to social media. Why is that? I think Why black folk are constantly trying to escape our own reality, reality because our reality is very painful every day you wake up mm. and it's just like what's going to happen today you are you live with your head on a swivel our parents told us from a young age mm -hmm. if you get pulled over to fight a cop do that mm -hmm. we are most likely to be pulled over stopped uh arrested and we are most likely to serve time and more time than our counterparts i've been arrested so when people are like, oh, well, you know, if people just comply, I get super triggered because it's like, yeah, yeah. just comply. Do you know how hard it is to comply when you mm -hmm. know that you didn't do anything wrong? You should not be in handcuffs. And someone's like getting these handcuffs because you go to jail. It's very difficult because human beings are not we're not primed to just let ourselves be taken. And yeah. Just, yeah, balled up. And it's like taken all away of that is very triggering, and yeah. more so if it's a part of kind of the legacy of your people. And it that, is legacy the because now it's like, okay, I just proved the stereotype. Mm -hmm. I mean, that Will all went through my mind. Trayvon? Yeah, you know, or yeah. I'll be a hashtag or yep. something. Yep. So there's a lot that we reckon with, and I think that's a part of what sometimes is yeah. frustrating is that people don't seem to understand in terms of the mental health aspect and how that is impactful for us and yeah, yeah, how definitely. we need care and we need to give ourselves grace. I honestly feel like at some point, just same thing with narcissistic relationships or abusive or toxic relationships. At some point you have to preserve yourself because if you mm -hmm. ask that person, Hey, you're doing this and it's hurting yeah, me. A lot of the people me. that are abusers, when you tell them that it's like, Oh yeah, I'm going to keep doing it because you're telling me, please stop. You're not, yeah. you're not hitting me back. Yep, you're, you're not, not trying to get the police. You're not yep. leaving. Yeah. So it's almost yeah. like free for all. And I, and I think that's typically what has happened here for black folk in America is this idea that we're so used to, why do we whisper? Why are we like, oh, we got to come on guys. We got to come up with some stuff. It's almost like we got Stockholm syndrome. Oh, you know, you're, you're that's not, we don't want to get them mad. It's like, why not? You're doing stuff to me and I don't want to get you mad. The idea yeah. of that I think is almost offensive to me because it is what happens in abuse. It's like you're yeah. tiptoeing around on eggshells and the person yep. abusing yep. you is like, doo, 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 yep. just going along like everything is fine. It's like, you're hurting people and you got the audacity to just be whistling and walking around like nothing mm -hmm. is wrong. And that's, that is literally what's happening in America. We have people that are hurting other people and walking around like, nothing is wrong. Why are you crying? It's like, because you just punched me in the face? Could that yeah. be why I'm crying? Yeah, like that's <laughs> literally what it is. Let, 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 let me ask you this, because what I realize is that you're you're a storyteller and I love listening to you and we'll do this for a long time. But I want to make sure we we tell me how the things you're just talking about, how you approach this. How does that feed into the book? How does that feed into what you wrote about? And, and like, where does that stand as far as like. What do you, what's your expectation, I guess? What's your expectation of what it's going to do? Yeah. I mean, when I started writing the book, initially, I thought about all the Black women that I had met on LinkedIn over the past two years mm -hmm. and how instrumental they were in helping me to heal. Because after George Floyd was murdered, I was going through a lot of anxiety and I was just like, oh, what is going on with this country? This doesn't make any sense. Like people are saying they don't know or they don't understand. How can they not know I'm not even from this country and mm -hmm. I've 
taking the <laughs> chance to like open up a book to know what's happening here. So it really was, I think, very strange for me to see that people were so shocked with what happened. 4,000 yeah. people, more than 4,000 were lynched since the end of Reconstruction up until Emmett Till. That's the last documented, uh, and that was mm -hmm. 1955. So it's like, my dad was born in 1942. It's mm -hmm. just this idea that people were sitting here like clutching their pearls, like, what? This isn't America. It's like, mm -hmm. actually, this is very much America. As a college very professor, American. it's American yep. lit. So it's not like, this is not foreign. And, and talking to so many women and being sheltering in place because of the pandemic, I started to see that all of us were having the same issues. Like, oh, you're getting on these Zooms and people are just like cutting into your, like when you're asking a question or talking, people are just like interrupting you. Or, you know, a lot of us were worried because, you know, we're home. So it's like, I got a hair wrap on and my, my got my twists out and my hair mm -hmm. is all over the place. And people are like, oh, your hair. And it's like, we're sheltering in place. Like your cat is walking on your keyboard. Do you see right. me <laughs> telling you about that? <laughs> Don't worry about my hair. <laughs> so it was just so many things that were going on. And I think, a lot of us started to have community around these little pockets of space on the internet and LinkedIn became one of those spaces. Mm -hmm. But the stories that I was hearing, I started to feel like, how do we get this information out? Because I'm just learning a lot of this stuff. Like I'm learning that like, it's not normal for people to, why am I constantly right. validating my you know expertise? Or why am yep. I feeling this way? Or why have I not really taken the time to figure out why I code switch? All these things that started to come to mind. I wanted to find a way to document all of that. Mm. And find a way to really find out, well, what does the research say about that? Because I'm always, like I tell my students when I'm teaching like a research writing class, a comp, like, don't just tell me your opinion. Like, you have to validate that. You have to have sources. You have to mm -hmm. have done your research. Gather some statistics. It can't just be your anecdotal experience. So I started to wonder, is the anecdotal experience the same as what has been researched? Mm -hmm. I just started digging through everything that I was learning and started to think about, well, how can I put something together that will help people to understand it's not you because that's mm -hmm. what i was thinking like it's just me yeah, i'm just yeah. weird like i'm not from here so maybe i'm just processing stuff wrong right. <laughs> maybe right. i'm just being oversensitive but right. i started to see all these different patterns and i wanted to find a way to help back women not navigate the workplace in the sense of hey you know this is how you brown nose to the boss and get yeah. a promotion and blah 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 it was more like this is how you preserve your peace because yeah. they don't want your peace to be preserved. And while we're waiting for all these different initiatives and people posting black boxes mm -hmm. and making these statements two years later, it just seems like his business as usual and people are just back to the same old, same old. So in the meantime, how do you steal yourself to understand yeah. that it's yeah. not you? There's nothing wrong with you. This is generational. This is historical. This is something that has been studied up, down, and around. And at the end of the day, what can you do? to make yourself feel mm -hmm. stronger, better, whole, hopeful, instead of hopeless. I think yeah. a lot of it was also from the mental health aspect of it, of I need to try to figure out myself. I you know I keep saying it was my love letter to black women, but in a sense, it was also my love letter to myself. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of us, we have been talking to ourselves so negatively for, yeah, so, for long so long that yeah. we have to get out of our own minds to understand that everything that's happening is not a figment of our imagination. Yep. A lot of us are going through the same things. Probably the majority of us, I would yep. venture to say are because the stats don't lie. I always say men lie, women lie, numbers don't. And if the statistics are saying this is happening, yep. study after study after study, it doesn't matter if someone's gaslighting you. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter if someone's, y'all see, when people troll me, I just be like, okay, I want to acknowledge that I, I, cause I don't want them to think I didn't read it. I read mm -hmm. it, but okay. Because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, I'm not going to argue. Jay-Z said that if you argue with a fool, people are not going to know who's who. Which one? That's so true. I don't argue with people. I'm just like, okay, I acknowledge you. Wonderful. But still doesn't change the fact that I know what I know. And I yeah. want other people to know it too. I want people to unplug themselves from this matrix of believing that, oh, you know, let's just try to appease our abuser. Mm -hmm. I would never encourage anybody to do that because at the end of the day, what happens when people do it? A lot of times they end up dead. A lot of times mm -hmm. they end up suffering from mental mm -hmm. health illness yes, because yes, yes, they're yes, so yes. beat down. So would we ever, if someone in your family came and said, my husband is abusing me. We wouldn't tell the person, well, just go stick it out. Try harder. Mm -hmm. Work a little bit harder, put in some extra hours mm -hmm. and maybe they'll see your worth because they never will. So it's yeah. up to you yeah. to preserve yourself. And that's someone that is coming from me who's a domestic abuse survivor, both yeah. emotional and physical. And yeah. that person will never 
change. It doesn't matter what they promise you. They'll promise you the moon, the stars, the sun, the earth, everything. They will never change. So you have to change. You have to change your frame of mind. You have to change how you look at yourself, think about yourself, how you navigate. And then decide, can I be here until I can get my ducks in a row and get into a better situation? Is this just not the place for me? Madison Butler, who I talk to all the time, Mm -hmm. really amazing person. And yeah, I love this idea of imposter treatment versus imposter syndrome. One of the things that she talked about that I interviewed her for and we talk about, I, I mentioned in the book, was this idea that not every space deserves you. Right? right, and a lot of us right. are suffering, like Lisa said, the idea of imposter. I'm glad she said that because it's mm-hmm. one of the big takeaways that a lot of people tell me, and I didn't really even realize it was a, even that big of a deal. That mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I had a conversation with Martin Pratt, and I said, "Oh, I'm suffering from imposter syndrome." This was during uh, like 2020, 2021. He's like, "Why? Why do you keep saying that?" And I'm like, right. "I don't know. I have imposter syndrome." He's like, "No, you don't." And I'm like, "Yeah, I do." <laughs> He's like, "No, what is? No, you're not an imposter." And he was just like, "I started to look it up." I'm like. What is imposter syndrome? And looking into what it actually is, it historically speaking, it's not even something that is an old philosophy or psychological diagnosis. It's literally something from the 70s where two white women were just like, imposter syndrome is a thing where people just feel like they're not confident. And it, mm-hmm. it just developed into this psychological diagnosis or just more of an anxiety, like, oh, I'm not going to, people will find out that I don't know what I'm talking about. And I, and I started to think about the idea that for most of us growing up, even when I was picked on, bullied at my at my most bullied, I still was bossing up in the classroom. There you go. There Everywhere you go. I went, teachers were like, up. You, "You, yeah, you bet, you supposed to, you would get an A, and your parents would be like, "Good, like that's what you supposed what to do." Supposed like, to do. <laughs> we were always encouraged. We we were excellent. It, none of our teachers, coaches, mentors, parents, any, everyone in the community could ch- check you and make sure you were in That's place right. and do what you were supposed That's to right. do. So where do we get this idea of being imposters? Not until I went to University of Florida yeah. and got to a yeah. campus where nobody looked like me. And I was like, I probably should not be here. I probably yeah. should have went to FAMU because yeah. it's just not yeah. comfortable. <laughs> because everyone looks at you like, I had literally had a lot of people that were like, how come you, how did you get in here? You know, like, were you like a, like, you know, they they think that you, yeah, like they think that you are not qualified to even be there. I I used to see that all the time, especially in journalism school, because in journalism school, there really were not a lot of black students. So you have this idea of, okay, now I have to prove myself because in my community, everyone thinks, um, these knees, I'm like all of that. And I come into these environments and everyone's like, are you supposed to be here? Like, I think you're not in the right place. And no one cared about you. No one really encouraged you or felt like you were supposed to be excellent. And I mm-hmm. feel like that was where the idea of imposter treatment came from. It's yeah, almost yeah, like, yeah. which came first, the chicken or the egg? And it's mm-hmm. like, for most of us, we were not imposters in our community. If we grew up around, even if it was in a, a suburban community, but we had a strong family that really yeah. encouraged us and wanted us yeah. to do well, we wouldn't be where we are today if somebody hadn't put us on the right track. But when we got into those tracks, when we got into those spaces, a lot of times that's where the anxiety started to come in. Because it was like, people are acting like, I don't know what I'm talking about. I got my bachelor's, I got my master's, I got multiple master's, I got this, I got that. And so people are still like, no, that doesn't make sense. And you're like, it does make sense. I'm telling you. And they would push back or make it seem like you didn't belong. And that's where this whole idea of imposter treatment came from. This idea that a lot of us are excellent. A lot of us are amazing. A lot of us are actually excelling and doing a lot better than the mediocre people that we're around. But for mm-hmm. some reason, mm-hmm. we feel as though, oh, I'm not, oh, we're stepping on eggshells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're afraid. And a lot of that comes from the fact that we are treated like othered, like we don't belong to be in the spaces where we are. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to share a lot of that, the insights that I learned, the things that I saw, the conversations mm-hmm. that I was having with women on LinkedIn to make sure that people were just clued into this idea that there's a lot of things that we take for granted. And it goes back to language. It goes back to programming and narrative where we've internalized mm-hmm. a lot of narratives about even our, ourselves and our community Definitely. that are yeah. absolutely false, wrong. not true, yeah. toxic, wrong, harmful. And I rebuke them. I'm like, mm <laughs> Nope. I like nope, it. Nope. nope. <laughs> like I rebuke you. <laughs> I rebuke uh, that because it's just not true. And it's just like, I'm not going to sit here and allow someone to tell a lie on me. Like I would never do that. It's, just, it's why when I got arrested, they were like, if you sign this, yeah, um, yeah. sign this, no, no, it was like no trespass. So they were like, okay, it was like a $2 pack of batteries. So they were like, if you sign this, no trespass, 
we'll just let you go. Just sign it. And I was like, no. <laughs> Not signing. So, well, we're going to call the police. I'm like, do what you got to do. That's literally what I told the woman. I'm like, you're going to just have to call them because I'm not signing that because that would be a lie. Mm -hmm. So there is a mm. sense for me in that you have to stand on your truth. If you don't have your truth and your word, what do you have? And I think for those in the majority, they're constantly being like, you know, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'm going to do it. But they don't. So it's almost like then you, it's like Maya Andrews said that, you know, it's like when sh someone shows you who they are, believe them. You gotta and believe if someone's them. constantly telling you, I'm gonna, but they don't, it goes back to the whole idea of abusive relationship. That, right. I'm gonna, and a year later, they still doing the same shenanigans that they were doing. So mm -hmm. at what point do you start to say, you know what, I got to prioritize mm -hmm. my own health, my own well-being, my safety, my yep. kids, whatever it is. And I think that's where we need to get as a black community, to be honest with you, we have to prioritize ourselves and not worry so much about the environment. Um, Nicole Hannah-Jones said it when she left the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, when she didn't get tenure. She's like, it is not my job to heal them. That's right. And she right. had to move on and go to Howard because it was just like, I'm not going to just sit here and try to heal someone that doesn't want to be healed. Mm -hmm. Or am I going to get to a safe space and heal myself? Yeah. And I think that's why I wrote the book. I wanted to let women know that I'm not yelling, meaning that we're also seen as aggressive and that's right. yelling that's right. and over exuberant, but that's just, we're just magical and over exuberant and just all of that. So that's why it's nothing <laughs> to do with, we're mad. We're not angry. We're just popping. Melanin is just popping everywhere. And that's just how we roll. But that doesn't mean something is wrong with us. That doesn't mean it's not professional. I will yeah. wear these on a zoom. I will wear these. I, I'm, I'm never going to temper myself down. Yeah. to make someone else feel comfortable. And I think for a lot of us, that's what we were doing. That's we've, what we've been, been doing, yeah. Stockholm syndrome of if I tiptoe around the kidnapper and then the kidnapper gonna come in there and, and silence of the lambs you anyway. So that's why right. are you up there tiptoeing around and trying to appease someone that's like, you know, a psychopath who's going to eat you a lot, like a, what is it, <laughs> KIT beans? Like, if, if you, why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense because oh, at the man. end of the day, you're going to lose if you do that. Let, 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 let me pause you, Liz, because there are a couple of things I, I want to try to get to. Uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, ne never dim your light. I, I, I love that, uh, what's her name, Brunson mentioned that in her interview with Oprah, like, we need to surround ourselves with people who want to ask us to dim ourselves because that's what real love is all about. That's it. So a couple of quick things. We only had a couple of minutes left, Liz, and I want to respect your time. Yeah, okay. Why are you lying and telling people you have a 24 year old daughter, girl? <laughs> what, what, what is this about? My daughter, her birthday was nope. two days ago. Four... Nope. And she, she, she ate. <laughs> she ate. She's 24. I have a 24 year old. And the funny thing was, I'm like, how's the book? Um, you did you I sent her a book and she was like, um, I was like, how how'd you like it? And she was like, uh, I haven't really started it yet. I was like, thanks. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> so you don't have any feedback for me or anything. She's an English major. So I was like, you can't give me any tips or any feedback. <laughs> you know, she's like, no. Look. I, I just want you to know, Liz, what is worth. When I get my copy, I'm definitely going to read it. And I buy all my friends' books. I, I, I want to be I there you're and a supporter. support them. You're the one that predicted I was going to have a book two years well, ago. We got to well, make sure we I mean, throw that know, in let's, there, too. Let's not make it like I'm some sort of genie. I, oh, I really did are. demand that you, you write demanded. the book. And yeah. I deserve half. I mean, let's just put it out there. I deserve <laughs> hey, that I'm half. I'm giving you all. We already talked about how 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 I'm just this you know giving person. So let's give you everything. I'll give it that, all. That, to that's you. all I want. It was all your I want idea. Was everything. You it's, you it's, told me to write a book. So I, look, I knew it was coming though. I knew it. It's like you're you're so good at this. It was perfect. Um, let me also just mention Lisa. I tried to get Lisa on the show and she turned me down. So <laughs> you know, I just want to. I'm not putting nobody business out there. In the <laughs> You're street, not putting them in. You but, heard it. They ain't hear it from you. But, but. <laughs> like, I ain't putting that in the grapevine. But, I'm, I'm sure Lisa you know, will, you know, will, will grace you with her presence at some time when she has time. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, Lisa's uh, <laughs> amazing. I've met so many brilliant and amazing women. I'm blessed to have been able yeah. to connect with so many amazing women on yeah. the platform there's so many people that are supporters i think everybody that's bought the book and posted about the book and 
been so supportive, inviting me on podcasts like you have and giving me a platform to talk about everything that I'm talking about. So I appreciate you for doing this uh -huh. and being a supporter. You're, you've been in my corner from day one. And it's a lot fine, of people yeah. have been following me for a while. So I just appreciate everyone's support and being there and encouraging me. A lot of times people will DM me and be like, are you okay? <laughs> are you okay? You know, don't <laughs> let the trolls get to you. That's how yeah, you do, girl. Lisa. Poor yeah. Lisa. Lisa's so sensitive too. Don't let the trolls get to you. And I'm just like, you know, it It helps me to stay strong. You know, it yeah. helps me to stay motivated and to push through. Because at the end of the day, I am this person that I want to see people win. I want to see people healed. It, I think a yeah. part of that is probably because of what I've been through. And yeah. I just feel yeah. like no one should be hurting. No one should be in pain. I just don't want yeah. to see anyone. Ugh. And if I can help that, then... That's what I do. So I'm I'm grateful to be able to do that. I'm grateful that people encourage me. You you don't know, uh, Liz. I love you so much. It is it is it is a beautiful thing to see somebody who's really trying, who's really trying to be like uh, the best thing they can be and trying to give that to the rest of the world. Like that that means a lot to me, to me personally. So I'm always here to support. I'm always Thank like, you. man, let me elevate these voices of people who are 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 really talking about the right stuff. Um, so look, we're gonna have to close it on out. Uh, Liz, I promise you I am gonna be asking you again to come on sometime soon. I'd be happy because to. we didn't get to go through half of the stuff that I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> yeah, because I, I went on my rants about well, American history. <laughs> Well, but but there's still so much good stuff and all of that. I'm like, yeah, you know, you can't again. stop it now. So, I'm, yeah. I'm ready whenever you are. You set the Look, time and date and I'll be there. I, I will definitely do so. Uh, everybody, we're going to sign off. I don't have a new outro yet. Uh, so too bad. I love you <laughs> all. Bad, and so we'll sad. see y'all. <laughs> we'll see everybody Thanks, next everybody. week. Thank everybody. Thank you all everybody. for joining. We appreciate you. Bye-bye, y'all.